Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my talk today. Um, it will be about subscriptions in iOS. Uh, uh, and I titled it 2.0 because there's sort of an evolution that we will be talking about today. But before I get to that, let me briefly introduce myself, who's not known me before or seen me before. My name is Oliver, and many people know me as Coconetics on Twitter and my blog. I like to write about uh, topics of iOS development and sometimes Mac that sort of are, that, that needed me to get into them and sort of research some, something. And then I like to write about them. Yeah? And that's also uh, what informed this talk because I was solving a, s a subscriptions problem for a client project and I documented all of that and that became the material for this talk. And I'm doing this for um, five and a half years now, as you can see, full time. Uh, this is my other hat. I'm also with a startup, uh, productlayer.com. Uh, we, we have a social network where people can uh, talk about individual products. Check it out if you like. And final bit of uh, advertising is I wrote a book that came out in February. It's still current. It's still awesome. And because my publisher likes you developers at the moment there's a promotion with the mentioned promo code you get 41% of all books at manning.com um, including mine which you should definitely get and uh, if you tweet some feedback some pictures so about my talk with the pragmacon 15 uh, uh, hashtag I will randomly select one to get a free copy of my book all right here's a quote I found that sort of applies to my topic today. Opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. And this quote is from Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb. Um, and I think it's fitting to this talk because uh, subscriptions seem like a lo like lot of work. Yeah? Um, so many people say, ah, I better not, not uh, fuss with that. But at the end of my talk today, I hope you will all say, well, it's, it's gotten so easy. We should do subscriptions. And the topic um, basically is how to build sustainable, uh, a sustainable business around building apps. That's what all of us are probably uh, interested in. And so let's briefly review what kinds of things you can uh, sell via inner purchases. Um, of course, content that people get for your apps. You can sell functionality for apps. Um, you can sell services. Yeah? Uh, for example, something like Evernote, software as a service. Some things you can't sell. You can't sell any real world goods or services. Uh, I mean now via in the purchases. And you cannot sell any unsuitable content. And Apple is the charge of what is unsuitable. Uh, the classic inner purchase types, which have been in existence since iPhone OS 3, at the time it was still named iPhone OS, uh, were non-consumable and consumable items. And I'm showing this because if you understand what these individual columns mean, then you can also appreciate the difference between uh, the subscription kinds I'm going to talk uh, afterwards. And for non-consumable items, the user pay once and they keep it. Yeah? Uh, it's on the receipt, which we'll mention uh, soon. Um, uh, it's forever there. Uh, and this information that this user has purchased this um, is synced by iOS and also restored. Whereas a consumable in a purchase, uh, user can buy as long as they like, as often as they like. It's on the receipt only once. It never gets synced by iOS and it doesn't get restored by iOS. Now about subscription. Well, uh, even in 2009, there was a type of subscription um, uh, that users could uh, buy as often as they liked. It would be on the receipt once. Um, and well, I've got two emoticons here and this means it's your responsibility. It's implied by Apple's terms, if you use this kind of inner purchase, you have to make sure that it gets synced to the other devices of the user 
and that it gets that it has a way to restore it. And they don't do anything. Yeah, they demand you do it, and if you don't do it, they don't approve it. And this is why, and these are called uh, non-renewing subscriptions, and this is why I call them 1.0. Uh, that's the old crap. Uh, I, I just mentioned them. Um, this has been in existence since 2009. That's how it was done in the past. And probably few people did because it, it's a pain in the neck. Um, what is subscription? I uh, found something interesting here. Uh, subscription is an arrangement to receive something, typically a publication, regularly by paying in advance. And this is the part that interests us, paying in advance. We get money from our users every month in advance of them receiving something. And it also means a signature short piece of writing at the end of a document. Um, basically, a digital signature. So, um, fast forward a bit. You all remember Newsstand, which was introduced in iOS 5, uh, which was killed in iOS 8, or rather by iOS 9. And that's why I say rest in peace. Yeah. Um, not many people will miss it, yeah, because it was said to be the place where apps go to die. Yeah. Um, but what Newsstand gave us developers are new kinds of subscriptions, because Apple wanted to enable the business model of recurring revenue for you keeping something fresh. And at first I thought, okay, that will be publications. Yeah. So the two kinds of additional subscription services are auto-renewable and free subscriptions. And I put a newsstand uh, icon there because it was uh, originally meant to be used by newsstands. So let's review in comparison to the non-renewing subscription type we had before. For the auto-renewable ones, uh, we have an automatic renewable per periodically. Yeah? Um, it is on the sales receipt that is this digital receipt, um, forever. Yeah? It gets synced by iOS, it gets restored by iOS. Isn't that awesome? Everything's done. And the only difference for the free subscriptions is um, the users don't really, I, I put a 1x there, but they don't really pay anything because we don't pay for free. But it means the user says once, I'm going to subscribe to that. And this enables the automatic content download um, for a free publication, and it's also on the receipt uh, ongoing basis, synced by iOS and restored by iOS. Um, and the great thing here is, while free is still only available for publications, uh, the auto-renewable part was sort of, well, let's do that for other things as well, shall we, Apple said. And that's why we love it, because it's available for <coughs> many other uh, cases, uh, kinds of apps now. And I came to this topic uh, through something that I'm presenting here sort of as a case study, uh, a use case of a client of mine, uh, which was a relatively small German company. Um, they had 200,000 or have 200,000 independent salespeople um, who were having problems with a crappy web platform. And the opportunity I saw here was um, to give them an app that basically gets to their data much more convenient than this crappy web page. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, in that case, that was the niche that I wanted to uh, monetize on. Um, I was supposed to uh, do a free trial somehow because well, people should try it out and really see that this is a benefit to them, that my app is better than the website. Uh, so a free trial should be uh, available, and then after that they should pay for the use, and not just pay once, but pay on an ongoing basis. And it, it, there was really no development budget. Yeah? I was talking with them, negotiating, and it was clear there was no money they would invest in me. So the only way how I could pull off this app is actually to do a subscription. Yeah? So after the people, the sales people did their free trial, um, I would want to have some ongoing revenue from them so that I can uh, continue to develop the whole thing. 
And because of this, I also didn't have the resources nor the knowledge. I'm not a web developer. I only do iOS development for uh, quite some time. So I wanted to do the thing without setting up some fancy server that do, would do the subscription stuff. Yeah? There are some conditions, though, that Apple um, implies uh, when you want to do auto-renewable subscriptions. Um, as uh, the first thing is, um, you can do so-called a la carte in the purchases. Uh, to explain that is, say, you have like a, like a menu in a restaurant and you pick certain items. Say, in an app, you could pick certain functionalities that the user uh, would purchase. Yeah? But if you do a subscription, you have to completely replace that. Yeah? So they, if you do a subscription, the user has to get everything. Yeah? So it's a, either everything, he eats everything off the menu for one price, yeah? all you can eat, like we had yesterday, this all you can eat pizza buffet, sort of. Um, or the other is a la carte, but you cannot mix it. You cannot say, you give me money once for the in purchase, and then you give you money for the subscription. No, 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 no. Either or. And um, the app description on iTunes must contain certain things. Yeah? It must contain the subscription details, prices, and durations of the subscriptions you offer. It must contain a link, again, to the privacy, privacy policy. And it's not enough to have the, the link anyway at the, at the bottom uh, of, of iTunes. They want you to put it extra in the uh, text a second time. Um, and you also have to include a lengthy text which they provide, which you can copy paste, how auto renewable subscriptions actually work. Yeah? It, it explains, well, actually, on the next slide I have, have this, you will see in a second. And there's a big caveat that I uh, stumbled across because I was developing the app under my own developer account. And then the client said, well, we want the app to be in our name on the App Store. So I said, okay, I get it all, I, I'm at WWC anyway, so I ask the people if it's possible, and then once, once I've got it every, everything approved, I just transfer it. Yeah. So I went to the, to, to the App Store lab, got it all approved, got it on the App Store, took me a day. Yeah. In real life, outside of WWC, it would have taken me like two months, yeah. but at WWC, you can bark the people until everything is done, even on the same day. And in the hotel room at, uh, when, after, the, after the day, um, I wanted to transfer it and then suddenly I get the message, apps with subscriptions can't be transferred. So next day I go again to the App Store Review Lab, tell him my uh, uh, problem, and we agree that I basically change the bundle identifier of the app and create a completely new app on the account of the client, yeah, I changed the name in the bundle identifier basically, and then got this approved on the fast track, and then I was able to delete the, the first app. So I tell you right now, yeah, this is not working with subscriptions, so if you do an app with an auto-renewing subscription, and there's a few other things that this applies to as well, um, then you cannot do it on your development uh, team and then transfer it to your client. You have to do it on the client's account right away. So about the App Store description, mine looks like this. Yeah. Uh, I've redacted the parts where the name of the, the app can be inferred because my client wants it like that. But basically you, you see the, the top, this, the one paragraph at the top, that's what I came up with. And everything below auto-renewing subscription terms uh, comes from Apple. Yeah. And you have to put this in there because otherwise you get a met metadata re rejection, which I did get once. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you search for auto-renewing subscription terms, you find tons of other apps and their, their text that have copied exactly the same text into the App Store descriptions. Huh? So what does the user experience look like? Well, uh, the user gets a dialogue like that, where it explains you need a paid subscription to retrieve the data and that he can decide uh, whether he wants to go for a monthly or a yearly option. And because I want people to give me more money up front, yeah, uh, I promote the yearly option by offering a discount. Uh, once the user sec selects one, um, he gets this confirmation dialogue where, where it explains yeah, you want to subscribe 
to this, in this case, the uh, monthly option. And here I have seven days free trial. Yeah? The user can cancel or confirm. If he confirms, yeah, he gets a thank you. Uh, and then here, uh, we will get to back, to back to that shortly. There's also this manage button. Uh, and in the email, the user gets uh, a lengthy explanation already explaining again, this is exactly what you have signed up for. This will be renewed. Yeah, so you can see Apple is really careful to give the user as much information as possible so that nobody can ever say, I didn't know what I signed up for. Yeah. Um, and besides that, yeah, in this thank you note, there is this manage button. And uh, that brings us to the uh, next part of this uh, that is, how does the user manage his subscriptions? Yeah, it's not something that you can do in your app, but it's provided by iTunes, and it looks like this. Yeah, if you click on this Manage button, you get uh, to this information where it shows you until when do you have still free trial, and you can even change uh, the renewal uh, options. So you, if you start out monthly in this case, you can switch to annually or yearly, and you can also disable auto renewal. Yeah? Uh, you can also get to this screen from another way, namely uh, in the iTunes um, settings, there is this uh, dialog where it shows all the subscriptions you have active. And when you tap on one of these rows, you get put to the previous screen. And this page is actually also, you can uh, open URL, this link that I put on, on the bottom, and then uh, this page opens. So if you wanted to, in your app, you could say, manage your subscriptions here, somewhere in the extras, options, settings, and have a link to this page because it might not be found so easily. Yeah? Now, one, one topic of contention yeah, for, for a long time was this. Yeah? Uh, in this case, it's German yeah, because I missed my chance to make a screenshot while it was on an, on an English device, but I can promise you it's not less intimidating to the user if it's in English, yeah, because you get like, oh my God, the, the publisher of this app wants to have your name, your email address, your zip code uh, to send marketing and statistic stuff your way, yeah? Well, you, in this case, you could say, oh no, I'm not accepting that, yeah? But the good news is this is meant for publishers of magazines, yeah? And actually, it doesn't apply to us. You only see this dialogue uh, if you test your auto-renewable subscriptions in the sandbox, because at that, that point, uh, App, Apple doesn't know, are you a publisher of magazines or are you a normal uh, app developer? But they show this dialogue basically to everybody, and it says at the bottom, sandbox. Yeah? Um, but once you get the app approved, uh, you get an email like that from the app review team, which basically tells you, we are sorry, this is not, uh, you're not eligible for that. Uh, thank God I'm not eligible for that, because I don't want my users to be bugged with this, this dialogue. And um, should the case happen that you, st you have your app approved, it's on the store, and you make it a, a test purchase, you have not received this email, and you get this dialogue, yeah? then I was informed by Apple that this is actually human error. Uh, the app review team needs to push a button where it says, this app doesn't get this dialogue. And if they forget, yeah, you can send them an email, and then they flip the switch, and uh, people are no longer bothered with this marketing opt-in. So next thing, we'll briefly review because it's, it's not so, so easy to understand for somebody who's not, not dug through the documentation is how, how do I actually know if a subscription is active? Yeah? So after a potentially free trial period, which has a certain start, uh, the whole thing turns into a paid subscription. And uh, if the user chooses to have the marketing opt-in, as I said, for, for uh, magazine apps, uh, then this will be even extended. So at, at the bottom, uh, at the back of his paid subscription, he gets additional uh, uh, subscription time. And there's an expiration date for that. 
And shortly before that, yeah, uh, Apple sees, um, checks if uh, the extending of the subscription is actually possible because the credit card might have expired or some other problems might have arisen. Yeah, so if during this time, pre-flight until expiration, uh, they find a problem, they will send the user an email that you will not be able to prolong, um, uh, fix your credit card or whatever. And within 24 hours before the expiration, Apple will actually bill the user um, uh, from the credit card and then it will be extended and you have another paid subscription following that. And then it can also happen that the user doesn't uh, fix the problem with his credit card or he's, he flipped the switch that auto automatic re renewables shouldn't happen. Uh, then the subscription lapses and becomes inactive. But the user always has the uh, ability to buy a new subscription and then the, the whole thing starts again. So uh, in our case, because we are not interested in this marketing opt-in, uh, how does it look like? It looks like this. Yeah. Oops, it's just a bit uh, more compressed. Yeah. Free trials, something that's really awesome because there's no other way how you can offer free trials for something on the App Store. And these are the uh, uh, combinations that are possible. Yeah. Uh, there's no document on the internet that documents that. I found this out by trying all different kinds of products and, and uh, lengths. Um, at the top, you see the various lengths of trial period, and on the left side, you see the, the available lengths of subscriptions. Yeah, so you can have a seven-day subscription that has seven days free trials. So that means seven free days, and then seven days plus seven days plus seven days, or say uh, at the bottom, one-year subscription. Uh, you can have one month free trial followed by one year, one year, one year. And the, the free trial is limited to once per uh, iTunes account. So the user can't then go to a different account and say, I want another free trial. That's not possible. Apple takes care of that. And uh, well, my, my client said, uh, had said in the initially we want two weeks free trial. Uh, unfortunately, that's not possible. So I ended up having uh, the monthly option with seven days or the yearly option with one month. Uh, so I think that's, that's the best of, of both worlds. Um, in seven days, somebody should, should be able to see that my app is better than this other website. So for testing, um, all right. uh, for testing, the whole thing is slightly uh, accelerated because you don't want to wait a week until the subscription <coughs> lapses for testing. So if, if in the sandbox, uh, i.e. in test flight, somebody picks the one week uh, subscription option, it actually just takes three, three minutes until it expires. And uh, it simulates the auto renewing uh, several times, six times maximum uh, for you so that you can test that. All right, that much about uh, the, the ins and outs of the subscriptions, now we, we get to some geeky topics, yeah? So namely the universal app receipt. So the universal app receipt since iOS 6, or actually no, since iOS 7, this is uh, present in app bundles. So if you download an app from the app store, if you make an in-app purchase, yeah, there's this binary file that uh, is sort of uh, like a sales receipt for everything that the user downloaded, purchased, subscribed to. Yeah. It is a PKCS 7 container, which has a digital signature by Apple. Um, the container and the payload of the container are in ASN1 format, which is a binary format, um, which is sort of hard to parse. Yeah. Um, and uh, the con it contains the receipt for the app and the individual in-app purchases. And if you remember back at the beginning where I said uh, it's once on the receipt or it's ongoing on the receipt, this is the receipt I was talking about. Yeah? I was not talking about the email that you get from iTunes, you have made this purchase, but actually this file that's in the app bundle. Uh, and uh, it's refreshed with, with each in-app purchase. Uh, it's also refreshed Basically, it comes with, with an app if you download it directly from the App Store. 
and you can request that it be refreshed. And we will get to that shortly. Um, usually apps do have this receipt. There are some cases where they don't, like if you do build and run in Xcode, of course there's no receipt because it didn't come from iTunes. Another uh, scenario is if the user restores the app from a backup, then he, he might get an old receipt. And uh, well, in both cases, you can uh, ask iTunes for an updated receipt. Yeah. So to get to the receipt is fairly simple. Yeah, You get the main bundle of the app, and then there is a property app store receipt URL, which you can get from it. And in this case, I just instantiate the receipt data from that. Voila, I got the receipt. Now what do I do with it? I want to validate it somehow. And there are two ways to do that. The first is uh, to do that via the internet. And most people nowadays uh, do that. Um, or, or rather, you might think, yeah, of course, I, uh, I contact Apple's servers directly. Yeah? So I've got the app. And there is iTunes, which gives me this uh, receipt validation service. And I could, couldn't I just talk to iTunes directly? Yeah, like I make an NSURL request and ask uh, iTunes, is this receipt valid? The problem with this approach is there could be somebody in the middle, either on the device or on the internet, that says, yeah, of course this receipt is valid. Yeah? So not a, not a good idea to do that. You shouldn't do that. Rather, if you wanted to use the internet, uh, you would uh, send your receipt to your own server that you trust, yeah, do some certificate pinning that you know it's actually just my server that I'm talking to, and then your server should directly talk to iTunes, sending the receipt plus a shared secret which you configure in iTunes. iTunes will send you back uh, a JSON version of the receipt, which is way easier to understand and read, and then your server would uh, contact your app and basically say, yeah, this receipt is valid. Yeah? That this shared secret is configured in iTunes Connect. And uh, there, the problem with that is uh, there are different iTunes URL for production and for testing. Yeah? Uh, and the whole approach requires a server backend and web development. So that would be too much effort for a small business or like a quick app, like in my case. Uh, what I've seen uh, and I've noticed it with concern is that there are many StoreKit helpers available on GitHub that do exactly uh, what I showed you shouldn't do, contact iTunes directly, and that's just bad form. Yeah? You shouldn't, shouldn't ever do that. If, if you uh, take somebody, uh, uh, somebody's third-party library for validating sales receipt, you want to make sure that it doesn't use this approach. Yeah? I have a better suggestion to you for validating, namely to do that on the device. Uh, um, so in order to do that, let's briefly have a look at the anatomy of such a receipt. Um, it's fairly simple. This is the PKCS7 container, which has the signature I spoke about. In order to validate the signature, you also have the certificate chain. Yeah? And then you have the payload of this container. Uh, and this payload of the container um, actually are attributes that have a, a type, a version, and then always a value. And information that's contained in there is, for example, the app bundle identifier, the app version, um, the original app version, uh, something was, was uh, downloaded the first time. Um, and then there are also uh, inner purchases with the uh, type 17. And those in itself, again, uh, contain type value, uh, a type version value. And there are informations in here like the purchase date, uh, or the subscription expiration date, which is the, the thing that I was interested in for validating uh, the, the purchase of the subscription. Now, in terms of parsing, yeah, how do I go about that? Binary file, how do I read that? One often used approach is uh, OpenSSL. But as you know, OpenSSL doesn't come pre-installed. Yeah? Um, there are, of course, ways to get it compiled for iOS. But all of that was too clunky for me, and also it bloats your app. And I don't, I don't consider it uh, sensible for 
every app that uh, validates receipt to keep their own copy of open SSL. So that's just stupid, yeah. Um, then the question was, how, why, why not write a parser? You could write a parser. It's a spec that's available. It's not very easy to understand, but well, yeah, you could do that. Um, there are also uh, so-called ASN1 compilers where you feed in a spec and then it spits out C code for reading it. ASN1C is one example. Yeah? Then there's DT ASN1 parser by yours truly. Yeah? I went through the motions of writing such a parser. Yeah? Uh, but well, that was also a bit clunky. So uh, just recently, namely this week, I uh, open sourced Quito. And this is what I now want to uh, show to you. Uh, so Quito is, uh, I asked the, the question on the internet, what should I call a Swift open source project that deals with, with receipts? And this friendly guy, Hugo Tunius, told me, well, Quito, that means uh, receipt in Swedish, and apparently there's a trend of us using Swedish words for libraries that's really big. So I figured, okay, well, let's, let's call it Quito. And, and also I needed a name because now in Swift you don't prefix anything anymore. Yeah? You don't, all my other components, Objective-C would always be DT. Yeah? Uh, now we don't do that anymore, so that's, that's a nice name. And I'm happy to report it's uh, available on GitHub and it's available as a cocoa pot. So you can simply uh, add that to your project and uh, validate receipts with that. Yeah? So uh, let me show you how you do that in code. Yeah? Uh, in this case, I've got a, a helper. This example is in Objective-C, so you still have the, the prefix, but it would work the same in Swift as well um, without the prefix. Uh, so I get the main bundle, I get the receipt URL, and then I instantiate uh, the receipt with the contents of this URL. And for testing, what you can do is you can just uh, package a test receipt in the main bundle to use that instead. Yeah? But in our case, for like real world example, we, we take the receipt that's in the app bundle. So for, for validating, um, I, I skipped a step in the validation. Uh, Intentionally, uh, I did not validate the PKS7 container. Yeah? But I figured, well, the danger of this app being pirated is so, so far yeah, uh, that I don't bother with, uh, with the signature. Rather, there's some validation you can do on the receipt level, which I'll show in a second. Um, and that's, that's sufficient for my purpose. Yeah? So I'm getting the receipt. And if I'm not getting it, then it means it's missing. Yeah, so in that case, I need to ask iTunes for a, a new version, new, new receipt. Step number two is um, I get the bundle uh, identifier from my uh, receipt and check if it's uh, identical to the bundle identifier from the main bundle. And if, if that's not the case, then I know the receipt doesn't match my app. Somebody took a receipt from some other app and put it into my app bundle. No, this receipt is not valid. Then I, I get the app version from the receipt and compare it to the version uh, that's uh, in the info dictionary of, of the main bundle. Again, uh, it could be that this receipt was from an older version of my app. Yeah? Then it's not matching here and I need to get a, a new version from iTunes. And then also there has been the suggestion um, instead of getting these values from your app's info p list, which this was really doing, uh, you could also hard code them. Yeah? Then you, you make it less possible for some pirate yeah, to uh, get, get these values in there and then just be ac accepted. Yeah? I don't hard code them. It's, it works fine either way. Yeah? And the fourth step is um, a bit more involved because it checks the, uh, the, the hash, the signature basically of, of the uh, uh, receipt. Uh, I'm getting the identifier for vendor for the current device. Uh, this replaced the, the universal identifier we had previously. This is now what's, what's being used for identifying basically the user on this device. Um, and I'm uh, 
putting that into uh, a data object. Yeah? Get the UUID bytes of this uh, identifier, make a data out of that. Then I concatenate that to the hash data. And to this hash data, I also concatenate the opaque value that's in the receipt. And I also uh, get the bundle identifier data. Uh, Apple some, somehow, uh, for some reason, they say you shouldn't use the string, but you should use the actual data as it is in the ASN1 file. So I'm exposing that via the, the receipt as well. And from that, then you calculate a SHA-1. Yeah? And if the, well, I've got a helper function, DT Foundation, to do that. Yeah, it's a few lines of code. Um, and if this is equal to the hash of the receipt, then you know, okay, this, this receipt was for this user on this device. Yeah? Again, somebody could have taken uh, the, the receipt from an other device. In the, that case, the, the hash wouldn't match. Yeah? So, in, uh, the last paragraph here is if is equal to data fails, then we know again uh, this receipt is not valid. Yeah? So let's say everything worked. Yeah? So we got uh, our validation for the receipt. But if it didn't, yeah, what, would, what do we do? In this case, um, we need to refresh the receipt. And doing, to do so is relatively simply. simple. I create a refresh request. Um, I set myself as a delegate, uh, and then I start a request. And here, be careful. Um, this prompts the user for his iTunes password. Yeah? So you might want to show a dialog, uh, there's something wrong with your receipt. Uh, we are now going to try to refresh it. Um, that was a suggestion given to me by an Apple engineer. Personally, I don't do it. I don't, well, if, if the user came into the situation, he just sees the iTunes password, enters that, and then I get my new receipt. Yeah. But it's, it's a, a suggestion that might be uh, sensible in some scenarios. And here this uh, refresh delegate equals self is a SK refresh delegate uh, with which we are also uh, going to deal. Namely, there's a request did finish, yeah? and we're checking the class of the request. And if it's a SK receipt refresh request, then we know we have successfully gotten a new receipt. Or if that um, is a different class, the same delegate uh, method is also called when you load the products. Yeah? So this way you can tell them apart whether it was a, a refresh request or it was a request for the products from in a purchase. It can also fail, and we employ the same technology here. Um, if it's a SK refresh request, then we know the refreshing failed yeah, for some reason, uh, or else uh, it, the, the loading of the products failed. Yeah. Go back to the subscription options. Yeah. Here's this option already subscribed. Yeah. And what this usually does is it does a restore completed transaction via store kit. Yeah. But in our case, since uh, all the information is contained in the sales receipt, yeah, uh, this does the same thing as a refresh receipt. Yeah, um, so uh, if you do it via restore completed transaction, uh, StoreKit basically gets the receipt and then iterates over the individual inner purchases. Yeah, um, in my case, I iterate over the inner, uh, inner purchases anyway, so I just refresh the receipt in that case. So how do I get uh, the information that the subscription is actually valid and the user should get access to his data? That's fairly simple. I just iterate over the inner purchase receipts array of receipt. Um, I get a date now. And if there is a cancellation date on the receipt, yeah, which is possible, if the user calls Apple and says, I'm, I didn't want that, I wanted to cancel, there's some some rules under which circumstances the user can do that. But if support cancels the init purchase, there will be a cancellation date in there. And if that is in the past, then the init purchase is no longer valid. The subscription is no longer valid. Um, and so I continue. That means I ch jump back to the, the beginning of the four. Yeah? And then the other 
uh, check is to look at the ex a subscription expiration date and compare that to now. And if that's in the future, then I know I found uh, an inner purchase, a subscription, out of the subscription, uh, and okay, in this case, the user can get access to his uh, uh, subscription data. So that, that brings me to a summary. Why did I call that subscriptions 2.0? Uh, well, in, in, in this case, uh, it provides a sustainable monetization alternative uh, to having apps for pay, traditional in-app purchases a la carte or even advertising, um, provided you have an app that's sort of suitable uh, as a software, as a service, something that has an ongoing value for the user, like a productivity app. In my case, a niche app that's used by professionals to do their job a little better. And the great thing is iOS works for you. Yeah? It, uh, Apple takes care of the billing, the renewing, the expiration. Yeah? You can even do free trials, which you cannot do otherwise. Yeah? Um, and the universal receipt contains all subscription info. I've presented uh, a quick, quickly gotten and installed component to read all that. Yeah? I hope you will check it out, Quito. And uh, there's still a scenario that uh, you're not happy with this kind of approach, yeah, that Apple does everything. Yeah? You might, in this, that case, it might not fit your business plan or whatever. Yeah? Uh, in th that case, if you need more flexibility, you can still build a custom solution based on the non-renewing subscription system. Yeah? If you have your own server, if you keep track of uh, who bought what with some login on the server and you make sure that if users log in with the same login, they get access to their subscriptions, then subscriptions 1.0 are per perfectly fine. But for the rest of us who don't want to have a server, who don't want to have the back end, who don't want to go to some iTunes server, the solution I proposed is, I think, quite enticing. And that brings me to the end. Thanks for watching. You can find me on the internet as Coconetics or via Product Clear, and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Do we have some uh, minutes for some questions? Yeah, all right. Are there any questions in the room? There's one. Uh, Let me. If I remember well, uh, uh, when you validate the receipt, uh, basically you took the, uni uh, the vendor identifier. But uh, if I remember, remember well, basically this identifier can change if the user cancel your app and install it again. So how do you can be sure that uh, basically this value matches the one that is included in your receipt? Well, if you, you remember correctly, and it, you're absolutely right, the, vendor, uh, the identifier for vendor changes. Uh, if the app gets deinstalled and reinstalled, if it gets installed on a different device, yeah, Apple uh, implemented this uh, identifier for vendor so that we cannot track the user anymore. Yeah? But of course, there's also a solution for that. That is, we just refresh the receipt. Because Apple knows that it's the same user because of the iTunes account. If you are then on a, on a different device, and consider the following situation. Yeah? User subscribes on, uh, to the app on one device, and then via iCloud backup, he restores the same thing on a different device. The identifier for vendor doesn't match. So what you do, you refresh the receipt, you get a back, a new, back a new one that has the correct identifier for vendor. Hmm? Anything else? So thank you. You've been a great audience. Oh, there's a come. You can approach me afterwards and ask your questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>